Okay, students, I'm not going to kill you with notes today, so I'm going to keep this video to 15, no more than 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to basically take you through three different scenarios involving probability. We're in sections 13.5 and 13.6 in your textbook. Um, and then I'm going to give you time to play, to work some of these out, try them. Each situation is a little bit different, but you'll get the idea, and I'm going to let you kind of struggle through some of them. So, first big idea is that we need to understand that when we have multiple events happening, that we are going to multiply the probability. So, let's say we have two probabilities, probability of A, event A happening and B happening, we're going to multiply the probability. So, probability of A times the probability of B, when we have independent events I made a huge mistake on the note sheet follow right now where it says no replacement independent should be with replacement because we're replacing most common example we're going to look at here would be drawing marbles from a bag from something you draw a marble out you replace it therefore that is not affecting that first marble being drawn out is not affecting the second marble being drawn out they're independent events now, if we have dependent events, we're again going to multiply, but this time it would be without, please fix my typo, so you're not confused, without replacement, you draw a marble out, you now have one less marble in the bag, and these would be dependent, because now my probability of drawing a second marble of a certain color is affected by the fact that I have one less marble. And so that's what we're going to use here, we're just using this notation to represent a conditional probability. Probability that event B is happening given that event A already happened. This line right here, this vertical line, is read as given that A already happened. Okay, that's just some notation for you. You can read through that a little bit more or check your book, but let's look at some examples. So I've got a coin is tossed and a spinner is spun. Let's go with the same spinner that we were looking at yesterday. There are four equal sections on my spinner. So what's the probability of the coin landing on heads and the spinner landing on green? So to calculate my probability, I'm going to say P. I'm going to write out a little bit of notation. You don't have to necessarily write all of this out, but I'm going to say that I'm calculating the probability of heads and green. I guess I should check my switch my colors here. Sorry. Gotta keep things organized here. Heads and green, which is gonna be the probability of heads times, so they said we're gonna multiply the probability of the spinner landing on green. So I'm simply gonna take my two probabilities, probability of my coin. Oops, I made that paper. I'm gonna move this all over. Probability of my coin landing on heads is going to be, well, one out of two, because I've got two sides to my coins, it's heads or tails. And my probability of my spinner landing on green, we said, is going to be one out of four, assuming there are four equal spaces on my spinner. And I'm going to multiply the two fractions, multiply across the top and across the bottom. Answer here, one times one is one, two times four is eight, and I'm done. Always check to see if you can actually reduce your fraction, this one, one eighth. Okay, another way to get this would be to actually list out your sample space. Sample space is what we refer to when we say all the possible combinations. So I could have listed out that I could have a heads for my first event, or I could have had a tails. And I'm listing it four times because I have a spinner, and I could have had green for my spinner, I could have had red for my spinner, I could have had... Let's see, I think there's a blue section on my spinner, or just for fun, let's say there's a purple section on my spinner. And if those are my four sections, green, red, blue, purple, I have listed out every combination of tossing a coin and spinning a spinner, what could the outcomes be? And you can see that the heads and green is one out of those eight options that appears in my sample space. Okay? Now, it's not always going to be ideal to list them all out, but if you like that visual, it shows you what's going on here. Second one, we'll do a couple more together. Ashley wants to buy a drink from a vending machine. In her pocket are two nickels, three quarters, and five dimes. 
What's the probability that she pulls out two quarters in a row? She is not putting the quarters back in her pocket, and therefore we say that this one is an example of a dependent probability situation. So this one was independent. Now I have dependent. So probability of pulling out a quarter and another quarter turns into probability of turning out, pulling out a quarter. Smart board's catching up. Times probability of pulling out a quarter given that she already pulled out a quarter. And I know that doesn't mean much to you. I'm just getting you used to kind of this notation. Let's put some numbers with it. It's going to make more sense. Probability of pulling out a quarter is going to be, well, let's see. She had three quarters. So three out of something. How many total coins? It looks like she had ten. Times second one, probability of pulling out a quarter. Given she already pulled out a quarter, well, if she already pulled out a quarter, she's down to nine coins. How many quarters are left? Two. So we have three, now there's two. So final probability here, three times two gives me six over 10 times nine, 90. Reducing that, I'm getting 115th final probability. And to the marbles. And a bit. There are four yellow, three green, and blue, nine blue marbles. Determine the probability of Drawing a yellow marble twice in a row with replacement. So you're asking yourself, it says with replacement. Does that mean it's independent or dependent? Think about it. Is the probability of pulling the first marble out affecting what you get for the second marble? If you're putting the marble back, and hopefully you're saying no, making this one independent. So I'm going to skip all the notation for this one. Let's just jump to numbers. We're doing a yellow marble twice in a row. So probability of getting a yellow marble, well, we've got four yellow marbles right here. So the probability is going to be a four out of total, four plus three plus nine. I'm getting 16 marbles times second yellow marble. I put that one back. I still have 16 marbles. I still have four yellow ones. Total is going to be multiply across the top, multiply across the bottom, and reduce Compare that to probability of drawing a yellow marble twice in a row without replacement, without replacement, back to here, without replacement makes it a dependent event. Oh, I'm going to like that sound. Okay, here we go. Dependent. So, good news. The first thing isn't changing. I'm still getting yellow marble. So probability of getting yellow marble in first draw is 4 out of 16. But when I go to my second draw, I have how many marbles left? I took one out. I did not replace it. I've got 15 left. The one I took out was a yellow, and therefore I have only three yellow ones left. The numerator may or may not change. I'm just going to point that out. Because if I was drawing a yellow marble and then a green marble, well, I would still have three green marbles in there. So... Or if it was a blue marble, I still have nine. I would not have to change this. So just be careful with that. Multiplying this out, I'm getting 12 out of 16 times 15 gives me 240. Reduces to 1 over 20. You're going to want a calculator for these. You're going to get some crazy numbers. We're going to jump down to E, and then I'm going to let you try some. Drawing a green marble on the second draw, given that the first draw was a blue marble and there is no replacement. Wow, that's a mouthful. How many events are happening here? One or two? In the previous examples, we've had two events happening. There's actually only one event happening here. The first event already, if you're thinking two, the first event already happened. It's kind of like that whole shuttle arriving at the station, and we arrive, and we know that there's no train waiting there, and all of a sudden our total number of outcomes is reduced, uh, our total number of time. Like that, because it says, given the first draw was a blue marble, we already know that, and there's no replacement that goes with it. So, really, the only thing we're doing, if I'm going to use notation here like I was using before, I'm really doing probability of drawing a green given that a blue was already drawn. Okay? So, there is no independent or dependent in terms of 
multiply, we're not multiplying two things, we're just doing one probability. What's my denominator? No replacement, and I already drew a marble. So I'm down to 15 marbles. I want to get a green one. The first one was blue. So I still have the same number of green marbles I started with, which was three in this case. So I have three out of 15. The answer to this should have been one-fifth. Okay? I'm going to let you try those. And actually, when you flip the page to the other side, I'm going to let you try four is a really good set of problems for you to work through. Um, just a quick review, because some of you I know are not familiar with a deck of playing cards. So things that you need to know when you get to the next page and try those. Because they're similar to the marbles, it's just you have different um, constraints here. You've got 52 cards in a deck. You have four suits. That would be hearts. Um, you've got spades. Looks something like that. What else do we have? Um, clubs. And you've got diamonds are the other ones. So we've got four suits. That means 13 of each suit. I've listed that there for you. Half the deck is black and half is red. So we have 26 black cards and 26 red cards because we have 52 total. So I'm dividing by two. And we have four. of each number or face. So if I say probably of drawing a three, that would be four out of 52, because I have two black and two red. I've got one of each of these for each number. So that'll hopefully help you out with the cards. Um, I did list most of that in there for you to refer back to if you need it. Pause the video right now and go ahead and work through some of those problems, or keep going and picking up on the third page of your packet where it starts to talk about mutually exclusive and not mutually exclusive events. Okay, again, another mouthful. This time we've got, the big idea here is that instead of saying probability of something happening and something else, I'm replacing that and with an or. Okay, so I'm no longer going to be multiplying probabilities like I was on the first page. Instead, I'm going to be doing what with them? Hopefully you're seeing that we are adding extra part here. If they're not mutually exclusive, that means there's overlap. Mutually exclusive means it's one or the other and there is no overlap between them. If they're not, I'm going to have to subtract because I'm basically going to be double counting something. I'll show you as we walk through. Okay, so we're rolling a regular six-sided die. What's the probability of rolling a one or a six? Probability of one or six is going to be probability of 1 plus probability of 6, of rolling a 6. And my question is, do I need to subtract any overlap? Is there a 1 and a 6 on the same side of the die? No. It's one or the other. There is no overlap. This is what we consider mutually exclusive. I'm going to use ME for short for my mutually exclusive events. So I'm going to take the probability of each, which would be 1 out of 6, plus another one out of six, giving me two out of six, reduces to one third. Okay, and you probably knew that already. You're thinking, okay, there's two that work out of six total, one third. Let's take a look at a different one. Still rolling a die, what's the probability of rolling a number greater than two or an even number? Okay, so greater than two or an even number. Probability of greater than two or even is the probability of greater than two plus the probability of even. Do I have to subtract? So your question you're basically asking yourself is, are there numbers greater than two that are even? Well, sure there are. Four would be greater than two and even. So this one is going to be not mutually exclusive. And therefore, I'm going to have to subtract the combination, this right here, is the probability, whoops, subtract on it. I'm going to need to subtract the probability of greater than 2 and even. So let's walk through it. Probability of numbers greater than 2. On a die, there are six numbers, and how many are greater than 2? Four. So I've got 4 out of 6 would be the probability of a number being greater than 2. Plus, probability of a number being even. On a die, how many even numbers are there? Three out of six. Subtracting. 
How many numbers are greater than two and even on a dot? So I'm counting greater than two would be three, four, five, and six. Which ones are even? Four and six. Two out of the six numbers on my die satisfy both of these. So my final probability here. We need common denominators. We have common denominator six. So I'm doing four plus three minus two. And I'm getting five out of six. It might help to take a quick look at a visual for that one. So I'm going to leave that on the screen and I'm going to move that down for a second. And if we actually just kind of list this out, or not really list it out, but draw it out, we've got the first thing we were considering was numbers greater than two. So numbers greater than two, we considered three, four, five, and six as my numbers greater than two. And then I considered even numbers. So I'm considering all the even numbers in another little circle here somewhere. And I'm including the 4 and 6 because they're even, but we also have 2 of these. Now that's 5 of the 6 numbers on my die. There's also a number 1. We don't want to forget about number 1. He's out here somewhere because he didn't satisfy either of those. The probability of rolling a number greater than 2 or even, my answer is the ones that only fall in, or is the ones that fall in either of those categories anywhere in the circle. So it's any of the ones in this circle or this circle or both. I just can't double count them. And you notice that if we would have stuck with the four plus three, we would have counted seven because we counted these two twice. So that's why I'm getting five out of six numbers satisfy one or the other or both of the constraints that I'm looking I don't know if that helps you to kind of see it that way. <clears throat> Back to the cards. I'll do one example here with the cards. Um, but I know I'm about at my 15 minute mark that I told you I wasn't going to go past. Drawing a card that is a king or a heart. King or a heart. Okay, so how many kings do I have? I've got four kings in a deck of cards, and I've got 52 cards. How many hearts do I have? Hearts is one of my suits, so now I've got 13 hearts out of 52. So I'm adding the probability that it's king, which would be four of my cards. Heart, I've got 13 hearts. And the only problem here is that I have one card that is a king and a heart, right? Because I've got one of every suit from a king. So I've got one king heart, one heart king, whatever you want to say, and I have to subtract that because I counted it twice. So total answer here would be 4 plus 13 minus 1, and I'm getting 16 out of 52, which of course reduces to 4 out of 13. Hopefully that will help you as you work, walk through those. Last thing there is that funky looking table. Um, this might actually help you. It's a little bit different display than the Venn diagram sort of thing that I just did. Um, the way you want to interpret this table is look for maybe total things up. So this entire column would be people that are enrolled. This is in different classes in my Parks and Recreation Department. So if I'm looking at how many people are in swimming class, I've got 90 when I add up that column. In drama, I've got... 100 and so forth, I could add up the art. So when I add all of these then, or just add all the numbers in the table, I'm going to get my total for everybody being 240. That's going to be important because when you're comparing how many people are in drama, I've got to compare it to the total number of people enrolled in classes. And now I can say that I've got 100 drama participants out of 240 total and reduce that. Okay? Be careful when you get to the ors. Um, go ahead and try working through those. We can go over those if we need to. One more. I'll keep it super short. Um, the last thing is the probability, if you flip to the back side of your packet, what's the probability of an event not occurring? Um, and the easiest way to define the probability of an event not occurring is, I think I mentioned this in my other video about geometric probability, is to use the complement and do 1 minus, because probability of 
something happening is at most one. One would be 100% chance it's going to happen because there's no way it couldn't happen. So take the total number of everything that could happen. That's your 100% or one. Subtract what you don't want to occur or what, yeah, and then you're going to end up with the probability of something not occurring. Easier if we look at an example. A die is rolled three times. What's the probability of rolling at least one six? Now, if we just entertain this question for a second, this is a very complex question. If we're saying at least one six, that could be that I've got one six rolled. That could be two. That could be three sixes because I'm rolling it three times. If it's one or two, well, it could be the first roll that's a six. It could be the second. It could be the third. It could be the first two. It could be... So you have a lot of cases that you would be adding up. So what if we figure out the probability of rolling at least one six as doing this guy and instead doing the probability of no sixes being rolled and subtracted from one because that's the complement. If you want at least one six, the opposite is no sixes. So what's the probability of no sixes being rolled? Well, how many numbers do I have besides six? I've got five numbers. So I'm rolling it three times, which means I'm going to be multiplying three probabilities. And the first probability is going to be five out of six because I have five numbers on my die beside the six. Second probability is going to be five out of six. And third probability is going to be you guessed it, 5 out of 6. So this really turns into 1 minus 5 times 5 times 5 over 6 times 6 times 6. I'm simplifying to 125 over 2, 16, giving me 91 over 2, 16. I don't believe that can be reduced, but you can check that. Okay? So that's a quick example. Just It's a real special case of probability, but can certainly make your life easier if you use it. I think I was a little over 20 minutes, so I apologize. You should have half the class left, though, to go ahead and work through some of these um, and see how far you can get. Okay, We will go over questions tomorrow. I won't stop recording. Yeah, you can stop watching my video. I'm just trying to get it to stop recording. And I'm not exactly sure how to do that, why it's not working.